Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Doyle, this is The Verge Degree Table, and today I'm going to show you how to run a combat encounter as a Dungeon Master in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. So let's dive right into it. So for this demonstration, I'm using Owl Bear Rodeo. Great website. Free, quick, easy, simple. It took me two minutes to set this up. I went on Google Images, downloaded this map, put it on Owl Bear Rodeo. Boom, we're good to go. Drop these tokens, and what we're working with here are four player characters. we got a cleric, a fighter a rogue and a wizard, and what they don't know is that there are four goblins hiding in the trees on these little rises that are over the hill. And the situation, our heroes came around the bend of this tribor trail on their cart and found two dead horses lying in their path. So our cleric and our fighter, one with healing magic and one with animal handling and both with decent strength scores, have gone ahead, leaving the wizard and the rogue on the cart while these two investigate what's up with these two horses lying here in the middle of the road. Now what's going to happen is these goblins hiding out are going to try to get the drop on our party members, and one way or another we are starting combat. So the first thing we're going to do is establish surprise. None of our player characters were thoughtful enough to actually look around and see what's going on in these trees over this road, which would be a perception check but all of our characters have passive perception. They're baseline situational awareness. They're neutral setting. So as a dungeon master, I'm gonna have those written down and attached to my DM's screen. So I know that my human fighter and my dwarf cleric here both have a 13 for their passive perception, while the elf wizard has 11 and our halfling rogue has 10. I'm using the starter set characters. If you wanna follow along at home, I'm going to put the link in the description down below. Uh, and the goblins are obviously just using the monster stat block, vanilla monster manual. I didn't homebrew anything. I didn't make any changes to these guys. So I rolled 1d20 to treat all of these goblins as a single unit, as a group. That does a couple things. It makes it easier on me as a dungeon master. I'm only using one number here. I'm only figuring out one result and keeping that in mind. The other thing it's doing is it's giving me probably a more down the middle result. If I rolled four d20s, if I rolled for each goblin, it is more likely that I would find a one or a 20 in the mix and have to deal with that. And that may be what you want, so keep that in the back of your head, but then you have more to keep track of. So these goblins rolled an eight, and that is not great, but they have a plus six stealth modifier. They've got one skill, they are stealthy. These goblins are sneaky boys. So that makes it 14, which beats all of my players' characters' passive perceptions. If it were one lower, right, if they rolled a seven, that would give them 13. That would still beat those 13s on our fighter and our cleric. In D&D, the active participant is trying to meet or beat the DC, the difficulty class, of the thing that they're trying to do, which in this case is beat the character's passive perception. So tie goes to the runner. So we have our surprise established. Now we are going into initiative. That's how we kick off combat every time. Initiative is the order of events, the order of operations. It's everybody's place in line. So our goblins rolled a 10. They've got a plus two to dexterity, so their initiative is 12. Now the player characters would roll for themselves, but obviously they're not here right now, so the cleric gets a three. Not great. And the cleric has a minus one to initiative, so that is a two. Our fighter on the other end of the spectrum here gets a 19. And the fighter has a plus three to their initiative, so that's a 22. Our rogue has a plus three to initiative and gets a 12, so that's 15 for the rogue. And the wizard sitting at 19 with a plus two, so 21, so not bad at all. I mean, the cleric, okay, is at the bottom of the list. But yeah, pretty good initiative roll. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write that list in order. Now, even though the goblins are going together, I'm going to list them each out separately. Just goblin one, two, three, and four. And you'll see why in a second. All right, first round of combat. Our fighter goes first in the initiative order, but our fighter is surprised. They don't know that they are in combat yet. So they actually do not take any action this turn. They don't move. They don't have a bonus action. They are just going to stand there, as is our wizard, our rogue, and our cleric. Only the goblins are actually going this turn. So goblin number one has 30 feet of movement, 5, 10. And now we're going to treat this little hillside here as difficult terrain. It's actually going to take twice as much of their movement speed. They move half as fast going over difficult terrain. So that's 10. Now this counts as 20. They have 30 feet of movement, but he only needs 25 to get up on that cleric. And now they are going to attack 
that cleric with their scimitar. Our goblin has a plus four to hit, but they rolled a natural 20. And this is a lesson why you, as a dungeon master, might want to roll behind the screen. One, it creates dramatic tension for sure. Two, there's going to be certain roles that you don't want your characters to know, like that stealth roll that the goblins made, right? But three, it allows you to fudge sometimes. Now, I don't fudge a lot. In fact, in my latest campaign, I rolled on the table 99% of the time because it's a little more gritty and realistic. But if this is a new game for new players or we're dealing with level one characters here. I might not want the first enemy attack of the game of the campaign to be a critical hit, but here we are, so let's play it out. Our cleric has an AC, an armor class of 18, which is pretty darn good, but that does not beat that natural 20. Natural 20 is going to hit even before I factor in the plus four that our goblin here has to their attack with a scimitar. So they are gonna suck double damage. Now in the goblin stat block it says hit five and then in parentheses 1d6 plus two slashing damage. So what it's telling you is that that five is the average and that's what I'll do a lot of the time to keep things quick but that d6 plus two is actually how to calculate how much damage they are taking. So let's roll two d6s. When you get a crit you can either double the die or you can roll twice so, okay, three damage plus two is five. So it's kind of a good thing that I rolled. I mean, unless you're trying to kill your players before they do anything, but that cleric is taking five damage. Now it's up to you. Do you roll the two dice or you just double the number that shows up on the die? But whichever way you go, be consistent. I like rolling twice as many dice because I like rolling dice. Dice are fun, even digitally. So that's the way I tend to go. So our cleric has just taken a hit for five damage from that scimitar. And I would really narrate the heck out of that because that was a natural 20 if we were playing for real. Now it's goblin number two's turn and they are hidden, which means they are pulling out their short bow and they are making an attack on an enemy who does not see it coming. So he's actually getting advantage on this attack. He's rolling two d20s against our cleric here. Albert Rodeo is going to add them together, but I see here's a 14. So that's the higher, right? We're not taking the two, we're taking the 14 because this is advantage. So that 14 plus four to hit with our short bow here, that is an 18, which is our cleric's armor class, which again, we are trying to meet or beat that number, the active participant, the tie goes to the runner. So sorry, cleric, but you are about to get hit with an arrow as well, oof. So we can just take the five if we wanna do that, if we wanna just take the average, but I would say if we're gonna roll, let's always roll. So four plus two is six. Our cleric has taken 11 damage, which is their hit point maximum. They are at zero hit points and they are dying. They are making death saves on their next turn. So bad news, folks. We got two more goblins coming at it. So you can already see how important it is to get surprise. You know, an ambushed party is at much more danger this has only been two attacks and okay, yeah, that first hit was a natural 20, so that's a bit unusual, but 5% of the time, maybe that's what's going on. Our goblin number three is going to attack our fighter. So our fighter has AC of 14. We, as dungeon masters, can benefit from having the player character's armor class on our dungeon master screen as well, so that when the goblin rolls a, well, if it's a three, we probably won't have to ask, but when the goblin makes an attack, we can say, you get hit versus what is your armor class every time. So goblin number three rolls a three, even with that plus four, that's seven. That is not near our fighter's armor class. So yes, goblin number three misses. Goblin number four is going to shoot an arrow at the fighter, why not? Maybe the goblins are more focused on the big bad armored boys in the front. So that is a 12, plus four is 16. That beats our fighter's AC of 14. So again, we are going to roll damage. Three plus two is five, so our human fighter takes five points of piercing damage from that goblin arrow. And now I'm way more focused on the mechanical numbers side of this game in this demonstration, but you want to be descriptive 
with these hits. So the situation here is that they just came upon two dead horses, and it is this moment that the fighter realizes that there are black arrows, black feathered arrows, sticking out of these poor horses, dead in the middle of the road, and suddenly a goblin comes screaming out of the woods, trying to hit him with a scimitar. The fighter gets out of the way in time, or his armor saves him from that hit. And as a jolt of pain goes ripping through his shoulder, he realizes that the arrow now piercing him is a match for the ones piercing the horses dead on the ground before him. Now, our goblins here have a bonus action. So, goblin number four is going to use that nimble escape feature to hide again. They're, they can't stay in place. Everybody knows where they are now that they've shot arrows, and I forgot to hide for this guy, honestly, but that's probably a good thing. We're going to do a little demonstration for our new players here. This character is going to move somewhere deeper into the brush and attempt to hide. And now that's a three, so that does not beat anybody's passive perception, even with that nice plus six modifier. Even the rogue and the wizard back here know where this guy is, and that might be for the best because our cleric is already down. So the cleric is at the bottom of the initiative order, and even though they are surprised and wouldn't have taken an action, they are at zero hit points. So when you're at zero hit points and your turn comes up, you are making a death save, and that is just a straight D20, and whoa oh boy, so the cleric has failed their first death saving throw. Scary stuff. Top of the round, fighter is up. The fighter can make a medicine check, try to stabilize our cleric here, or I think what he would do most likely is try to stop these goblins from killing more of his friends. So the fighter is going to swing their great sword. A natural 20. All right, cool. Things are looking up all of a sudden. Um, that's a plus four, but it doesn't matter because that is a critical hit. That hits, it demolishes our goblins AC of 15. So again, we're going to roll two damage die, which with a great sword, the regular damage is 2d6. So we are rolling four two, three, four d6s. So that is 16. That uh, three there is right on the edge, but okay, 16. And we are adding another two to that. So that is 18 on goblin number three, which only has seven hit points. So that is dead, double dead. I would really lean into that description. And in fact, you can tee up your players, that classic Matt Mercer critical role move. How do you want to do this with a critical hit? Oh man, you can go to town here. Now our fighter took an action, took the attack action, and can also move. He's got 30 feet of movement. He's only gonna use five to get up face to face with this goblin here, because that's the kind of guy he is. Up next is the wizard. The wizard sees that the cleric is in trouble, and the cleric's the healer here, as much as they are also the tank. So the wizard's going to burn a spell slot and cast Magic Missile. Now, Magic Missile is an exceptional spell. It's an exceptional ability because the one thing about Magic Missile that you should remember is that Magic Missile always hits. A shield spell will actually stop it, but otherwise we're going to do 3d4. And we're doing one at a time because he is actually going to target Goblin 1, but if he does enough, he might hold back on that second one because, yeah, that's 4 plus 1 is five damage and what I do if it's not an outright total brutal kill is on my list here of initiative I keep track of the damage each character takes or at least each monster takes at level one yeah I'm definitely paying attention to what the uh, player characters are doing damage wise too but you can either subtract from the total or I find it's easier mentally to just keep a running total keep adding up each amount of damage until we meet or beat that HP threshold. So goblin number one has five points of damage with that first one. Let's roll our second d4 and that's a three plus one so that's four. So goblin number one is dead and the reason we allowed our wizard to roll each one separately here instead of just dropping three d4 on the table is that now there's an extra dart that they can, I mean, you know, certainly shoot into this goblin that killed their buddy for dramatic effect, or, maybe more useful, they can shoot this goblin here, who is still alive, hiding in the trees, ready to knock another arrow and 
maybe shoot another one of their friends or the wizard himself. So the wizard's going to roll. That's a four again. Pretty great. That is five on goblin number four. Now, if the wizard was smart or maybe cowardly, depending on your interpretation, they may get down off the cart and run away. They've got 30 feet of movement that they can use. They don't really have anything to use as a bonus action, but let's say they stay put for now. And now it's the rogue's turn. So the rogue was going to run up to goblin number one and take advantage of the fact that his ally was in melee combat and get his little sneak attack bonus. But now he's got no way to do that. He's a lowly level one. He does not have cunning action. He can't hide as a bonus action just yet, like our goblin friends here. So he is going to fire his own short bow at, let's call it... So the smart move is to hit the goblin that took damage here. The other move is to go after the one that is closest. So I'm going to run these PCs as if they were monsters. It depends how intelligent your players are, how intelligent you want your monsters to be. But yeah, let's say for this demonstration, the rogue is going to shoot the one on his side of the road. It's always better to focus fire at players if you're watching, but here we go. That is an 18. Yeah, even without the modifier of plus five to hit, we are beating the goblin's armor class. So let's roll some damage. So that is 1d6 plus 3 piercing, that is 8, and down goes goblin 2. So now we only have one goblin left, and you can see how quickly the tide of battle can change. Honestly, I was a little afraid for our player characters here, but they've killed 3 out of 4 goblins. And as written, and as I would play it, that means that this sole survivor here is maybe going to go run screaming. Right? Maybe they'll stop and negotiate, but goblins are cowardly, and they can bonus action disengage, right? He's not in actual direct contact with anybody, but he can bonus action disengage, and he can bonus action hide. So we're going to have him run his full movement, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. That'll get him just to this cliff side, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it. We don't have a grid on this map, actually. And bonus action, I mean, for his action, instead of attacking, right, he could shoot an arrow at the fighter or whoever else, but he is going to use his action to dash. Um, you know, if this was a player character, I might say, okay, make an athletics check here to see if you can save by jumping off of this cliff, right? But we're just going to treat it as straight, difficult terrain. So that's 10 feet of movement right there, 10 15, 20, 25, 30. Now, as an action, he, as a bonus action, he can hide, but he's got nowhere to hide, right? We could say, all right, these are very tall grasses and this like prairie kind of biome and let our goblin here try to hide, but I would not let the rogue do that, probably, based on this map, right? You gotta get to cover. So this goblin is exposed. Our cleric is making a death saving throw. That's a natural 20. So our cleric miraculously leaps back up with one hit point. Natural 20 on a death save means you are good. We've rolled a lot of 20s. Our cleric is alive, ladies and gentlemen. Um, unfortunately, that is their turn. That is their action. The fighter who was looking down at their dead comrade, watching the holy energy perhaps surround them and watching the cleric open their eyes once again. The fighter is going to turn around and, yeah, I don't know. Are they going to try to maybe non-lethally take this goblin out? Can he do it? 5, 10, 15, 20. He can get there. That's 30 feet of movement. So, yeah, let's say butt of the sword. We're going to try to knock out natural two and a swing and a whiff. So our fighter tries to knock out this goblin and maybe, you know, with mercy comes regret. <laughs> and now it is the wizard's turn. The wizard is not looking at a lot of non-lethal options here. Let's be honest with ourselves. So the wizard could maybe try to make a persuasion check or an intimidation check to get this goblin to stop running and explain what happened here. You know, who was riding these horses? Where have you taken them? Or, you know, it depends on your players what odds are. Maybe they're going to use their cantrip here, Ray of Frost, their range attack, to fire one at the goblin running away. So that is... 12 plus their spell attack bonus, which is plus 5, so that's 17, which beats 
the goblin's armor class, and that goblin is taking some damage. 1d8 cold damage. No modifiers on a lot of spells. So that's, ooh, one point of damage, bringing the goblin up to six. It has seven HP, so it is not dead yet. What is our rogue going to do, ladies and gentlemen? I'm going to say that our rogue uses their movement to get a clean line of sight. Five, ten... 15 and you don't have to take all of your movement and you can actually split your movement You can move attack and then keep moving if you have distance left But I'm going to say that that is a clean line of sight short bow with a plus five on it natural one now depending on your Table this is either uh, a comical mishap or maybe some situational Event, you know, do you want things to turn slapsticky or do you want an unfortunate, you know, hawk to fly by and catch this arrow or whatever? You treat a one as just a fail and leave it at that. Wait, time out. This rogue is a halfling, so we have luck here. So we can re roll that one and another one. What is up with? Oh, okay, okay, that's a seven. I thought these dice are oh, these dice are crazy, but okay. So seven and five is twelve. It's still under the goblin's AC, so nope, no good. Still, um, I don't know. I let halflings have luck. I might not always allow the feet, but that is you know that is your call. Now it is goblin number four's turn. It has been beaten and bloodied. It is sitting at one HP. It is staring down our fighter here, but it has. A bonus action disengage. So while begging for its life, it is going to move, which would normally trigger an attack of opportunity. But our goblins here have nimble escape. So as a bonus action, not their action, as a bonus action, they can use nimble escape to avoid sucking that attack of opportunity. So this is still difficult terrain. 10 feet, 15, 20, 25, 30. And now he's going to use his action to dash. Are we going to chase this goblin into the woods who's good at running and knows these woods? Are we going to regroup and then maybe follow him up afterwards? So that is not for the dungeon master to decide. That's for the players to decide. But it is up to the dungeon master. How hard do they want to go? Goblins can bonus action hide each turn. So if this guy was alive and successfully hid, successfully beat the passive perception of our party, they wouldn't know where he is. And someone would have to go looking for him rolling a perception check, but that is your turn that round. So let's say that the fighter decided to use their turn to roll perception at the top of the round, found this goblin, that would have been their action. They wouldn't have the ability to actually fire their bow and arrow or whatever at this goblin here. The fighter could alert the rest of the party to that goblin's location, which is typically what would happen. And now the rest of the party could take pock shots at this goblin here but the other thing is if this goblin were smart he would be hiding behind a tree and that would give him partial cover his ac would actually go up plus two the first roll of the game was a natural 20 so i pulled some punches that is my prerogative as the dungeon master especially this is the first fight of the campaign i don't want to kill a player character outright and i almost killed the cleric there and that's kind of my goal as the dungeon master i kind of want to always almost kill my party. Not always. I mean, you'll throw easy fights and medium fights and deadly encounters at them for sure. You want some variety there. But in a real fight, if I can take a player down to zero and the players still win, that's great. And the Dungeon Master has some tricks up their sleeve, even if you're rolling in the open, right? If I was publicly sharing these rolls, the players knew what the goblins were rolling, at least for their attacks, then I still have a couple levers I can pull. I can pull punches, right? Having these two goblins run out and fight with scimitars instead of hiding in the forest using their bows and arrows, playing to their strength, bonus action hide, you know, plus two from partial cover, maybe even plus five for three quarters cover if they're like ducking behind a log or something lying out on the ground. I could have played these goblins much harder for sure. The other thing to think about, and I'm going to put the goblin stat block here, those seven hit points are actually the average. Again, in those parentheses, you have 2d6. Very much like the damage, we could roll those 2d6 for each goblin, and I'll do that sometimes so that they have different numbers to keep the players guessing, but that's like a slider. We can take them up to 12. If we have, you know, very experienced players who are fighting very strategically, or we've perhaps handed out too many magic items, or, you know, there's a guest star our friends came to visit and now there are five players here instead of four we can jack up the goblins hit points and 
Sometimes, don't tell anybody, I'll do that in the middle of combat. If the goblin, or the boss in particular, is going to go down in one shot, then yeah, I will slide that up to maximum. I'll add some HP on the fly for sure. So I would be careful about changing things up before you have a real good feel of things, but you can always slide that HP. I would suggest not touching armor class. It is not fun to miss targets for the players, honestly, and for the dungeon master, but such is your lot in life. But the players are going to have less fun if they can't hit the thing than if they keep hitting it and they're doing damage to it and somehow it is still barely hanging on to life. The other thing you can do to change up combat, make it more difficult, is to add more combatants. You can throw in another goblin and it won't shift things too much, but be aware, keep in mind that the side that has the most actions per round of combat is going to be at a distinct advantage. So if the goblins outnumber the players, it's going to be a much more difficult fight than this here as an even match four on four. But if our friend visited, like I said, and then we have a fifth player character at the table, then like, yeah, throwing in a fifth goblin is going to even things back out. If we have tactical players, they're playing really smart, they're going all out every combat, then yes, maybe throwing in a fifth goblin is also a good idea. So that's a basic combat encounter. We established surprise. Who's hiding versus passive perception of the player characters versus, you know, active perception if they were looking around. We established our initiative order. We laid out the battle map. I mean, it was already in front of us, but we put out the map, figured out where everybody was in relationship to everybody else, and then we went through round by round. Move, action, you know, reaction, bonus action if you have one. Uh, we covered disengage, we covered difficult terrain, we had a critical hit there, which was scary, we made some death saves, and ultimately our player characters prevailed. We did a little bit of magic, we did a little bit of ranged attack, melee attack. If you want a deeper dive on all of this stuff, in the D&D &D 101 series, I have a two-parter on combat, actually, the basics, and then the more advanced strategies the player characters might do. It's not crazy advanced by any means, but it's things that they're less likely to, you know, think about without a reminder now and then. And if you want a little primer on how to run goblins harder than that, a little stronger than that, I've got a five-minute on goblins, how to, you know, really turn up the characteristics of the goblins and, yeah, make them evil little killing machines. This is actually the opening combat to the Lost Minds of Phantom, or the excellent adventure, perhaps the most popular adventure of all time at this point, which is in the starter set. If you've never played D&D before, or you've never ran the game before, or you're just looking for a good pre-made adventure, Lost Minds of Phandelver in the starter set is a incredible on-ramp to tabletop role-playing, and it's super cheap. I'm going to put an affiliate link down below. It doesn't cost a lot of money, especially considering how many hours and hours and hours of fun you and your friends are going to have by, you know, a small investment of money and maybe a little bit larger investment of time, but I'm going to help you with that investment of time by making this playlist that we're in the midst of right now, where I'm showing you step by step how to run the Lost Minds of Phandelver as a new Dungeon Master. So please join me next time as we hit the Tribor Trail, head to Phandalin, and fight some goblins, and see what happens next. I am super excited for that. Like and subscribe to stay tuned for all that good stuff. And thank you so much for watching. Get out there, have fun, watch out for goblins, be kind to yourself, be kind to each other, and I'll see you next time. Bye.